I'm really delighted to invite you all, you all being those of you I can see um, in the room, and we have a, a, an online virtual audience as well. But I'm really delighted to invite you um, to our LSE public event titled The Oceans, the Blue Economy, and Implications for Climate Change here in the Sheikh Zayed Theatre in the Chungkinku building. So um, just as a little bit of background, if you haven't read the blurb already, but you might have done because you're here, um, Blue Economy estimated to be worth over $1.5 trillion per year globally. It provides over 30 million jobs and provides protein to 3 billion people. So that's kind of important. Um, but oceans are increasingly in demand. And um, I, I'm, I'm thinking sort of increasingly we seem to be asking, though maybe not explicitly enough, um, whether the ocean can save the planet before the humans destroy the ocean. So we put an awful lot of pressure, I think, on the ocean, and we don't probably know enough about it at the moment, whether scientifically or economically or um, from a livelihoods perspective. So, so um, given that I think there's a bit of a knowledge gap, um, I'm, I'm particularly pleased that we have actually been able to bring together um, some of the real leading voices in the field for discussion on the risks to the health of our oceans and the opportunities in the transition to a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient blue economy. So our speakers are going to share their experiences and insights about key negotiations, such as the UN High Seas Treaty, the UNFCCC, COP15, um, scientific work being done in the ocean, and the role of UNESCO's Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, it's a mouthful, um, in bringing in hundreds of nations to one table, as well as the challenges, priorities, and opportunities to make the oceans, the blue economy, an effective part of the sustainable future. I'm also um, equally delighted to say that this event is endorsed by the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development as a decade activity. So um, we see this as a particularly important event. Um, we have um, two keynotes. So the way this is going to run today is we have two keynote speakers and then our visiting professor in practice, um, Dr. Darian McBain. Wave your hand. <laughs> um, we'll moderate a discussion with our keynote speakers and our two panelists. So as I mentioned, we've got a live audience and we've got an online audience joining via LSE Live, which is um, a new event streaming platform. I don't know if we've used it before. Look at our events people, or I don't know if I've used it before. And also our event is streaming on the LSE's YouTube channel. And for those of you who tweet or X, um, we have a hashtag, hashtag LSE Blue Economy. So if you're tweeting Xing today, please do that. So um, I will briefly introduce our keynote speakers, the two, the two keynote speakers, and our professor in practice is going to moderate. And then that's all you'll hear from me. I can relax like you guys and just enjoy the event and, 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 and listen to some really exciting speakers. So our first keynote speaker is Dr. Joanna Post. She's head of the Ocean Observations and Service Station at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. And she's working to sustain and strengthen the global ocean observing system. Um, so that it can deliver operational services for climate, forecasting, and ocean health. Uh, before IOC, Joanna was uh, with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, um, Secretariat for over a decade, supporting intergovernmental negotiations and leading engagement on climate change science and ocean-based action. Uh, she began her, oh, we've got two writers, um, people in media here speaking. She began her um, career as a science writer and communications manager and has a PhD in environmental science from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, UK. So that's Dr. Joanna Post. You want to just let people know who you are? There we go. And um, our second keynote speaker is Ishbel Matheson. She's the Chief Communications Officer at Marine Stewardship Council. And um, Ishbel began her career with the BBC, um, spending an extended period as an Africa correspondent. Um, she later, later worked as communications director for a number of not-for-profit organizations, including Save the Children and Overseas Development Institute. More recently, she's been working in fintech with a company called World Remit, which is an online money transfer service that provides international remittance services to migrant communities around the world. So that's our two keynotes. And then our moderator is our LSE and Grantham Research Institute visiting professor, Dr. Darian McBain. And um, <coughs> she's CEO and founder of Outsourced and uh, Chief Sustainability Officer for Asia, so that's OCSO Asia. Um, Darian was the inaugural Chief Sustainability Officer for the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the first CSO for Central Bank, Bank, Bank Globally. Uh, before this, um, Darian was Global Director of Corporate Affairs and Sustainability for Thai Union. Uh, this is a multi-billion dollar listed company operating globally and headquartered in Asia. And um, with Thai Union, um, Darian created an award-winning sustainability strategy. So um, I'll leave it to Darian to introduce the two panelists after our keynote speakers have shared their thoughts. So as they say, without further ado, 
Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Joanna Post to come and give her keynote speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at the London School of Economics. I work for the IOC, which is the lead agency also for the UN Decade on Ocean Science. So it's a pleasure to have multiple hats this evening um, and um, really to talk to you a little bit about the ocean, the blue economy, and climate change and take you on a little bit of a personal journey this evening. Um, because I've been working um, across climate change and ocean for a, over a decade now, uh, and really at the space bringing the science and the policy uh, and the engagement together um, under, under the auspices of the UN in various parts of, of that conversation. So um, I'll take you back to 2015, to Paris, which is uh, where I'm now based with the IOC. And... Um, there was great excitement in Paris in 2015 because the Paris Agreement was agreed. And that was also, if you like, a paradigm shift, if you like, for science because up, and for climate change science and scientists. Because up until that point, a lot of people had been saying, please listen to us, to the policymakers. You know, climate change is real. It's happening. We need to do something about it. And the Paris Agreement is the only legally binding uh, international framework in which parties, countries, governments agreed to do something about climate change. So it's a very important um, international agreement. Parties have signed up to do something about it. Um, governments have agreed through nationally determined contributions to commit to uh, limiting global warming to below 2 degrees C. There are, of course, challenges in that. Uh, I won't go into those. Um, I think many of you probably realize what the global temperature is this year and the fact that we are not on the right track yet. But I want to talk to you a little bit more about um, the challenges that, is, that means and is for the ocean. Um, way back in, uh, in 2015, uh, I think of you, some, of, some of you were probably still at school at the time, um, um, we, were, we were really thinking about at, uh, at Paris, um, this challenge of uh, country-led climate change commitments. But what was missing was the ocean. And the ocean was missing big time because it's a huge part of the climate system. It's it drives the weather, it drives the climate. It's 70% of our planet but it was really, really missing from the conversations which were talking about emissions reductions, it was talking about adaptation. We are land-based animals. It was all about what's happening on a very small part of our planet. And there was one word that really made a difference in uh, the Paris Agreement, which was in the preamble, and the word ocean was in there. But the ocean is actually in climate change in the Paris Agreement, hidden in plain sight across all the parts of it because of its huge role in our planet. So I have been working really for the last decade to bring that missing element into the fore of the climate change conversation and the climate change negotiations. The ocean is the biggest mitigator of climate change. It's absorbed 90% of the energy uh, produced by global warming, 90%, um, and it's absorbed 25% of the carbon dioxide. And that's big news because it's really causing massive problems. It's causing heat waves, it's causing ocean warming. This is serious news. Uh, anybody that looked at the news over the summer this year um, will have seen that we weren't just um, having the warmest year but the ocean was having its warmest year and massive heat waves in the ocean. And you have to remember that the ocean isn't just warming at the surface, it's warming well below. So up, and up to even two kilometers depth, the ocean is warming, and that's just gonna carry on increasing. So everyone, every living thing in the ocean is being impacted by climate change. And the other challenge of climate change, of course, is ocean acidification, that 25% of carbon dioxide. 
I have had the huge luck in my life to see the and and see coral reefs on the left hand side as well as unfortunately the the big challenge of bleached coral reefs on the right hand side as well and um, the huge um, heat wave in the ocean this year has caused much more bleaching than normal. The other challenge of, of climate change is uh, extreme events. They're on the rise. Sea level is rising. Interestingly, tsunamis are also um, adding further stress to many developing countries. And, see, and uh, the change in the climate is even impacting that. In terms of economics, in terms of loss of lives, in the US, you can say, well, over the last year, 300 lives were lost in 60 billion US dollars. In uh, Bangladesh, the numbers I just looked up uh, uh, for the last 10 years, $3.7 billion, but importantly, um, looking forward as well is really a massive challenge. One in seven people are going to be displaced by climate change-related events by um, 2050. So the ocean was missing at Paris. A few years down the line, and a lot of work later, and a lot of collaboration and bringing people into this conversation, talking about the challenges, talking about um, what is happening. The IPCC brought out a special report on the ocean and cryosphere and a changing climate. And we got to COP26. And COP26 was a massive changing point for the ocean under the UNFCCC. Because um, working with the UK uh, government at the time, there was a, a big drive by countries to, to bring this missing element into the UNFCCC, into the climate change conversation. And there was a mandate coming out of COP26 to, to dialogue, to really bring the ocean into the conversations around climate change. And coming out of that was, um, was an actual physical dialogue. People talked to each other about ocean and climate change. Um, in 22, we had the first of what is now an annual ocean and climate change dialogue at the UNFCCC. So the, the, big, the big news out of that is the ocean requires our urgent action. That's clear, I've shown you. But there are opportunities for ocean-based climate solutions, decarbonizing the shipping sector, climate smart fisheries, protecting restoring coastal ecosystems, scaling up marine renewables, um, must be reported, supported by ocean science, it must be um, supported by finance. Um, there are some real ocean-based climate solutions and there was a real push to blue the Paris Agreement and to bring in ocean at the heart of that conversation. And we took that message actually in 2022 to, to the UN Ocean Conference, um, which has a, um, out in Lisbon to, to really bring in climate change into the ocean conversation. But there's still work to be done now. So the ocean still needs the recognition. It still needs the investment. Um, I've put some figures on this slide, which uh, will give you some ideas of, of, of what we're talking about. So the whole world is, uh, the GDP of the whole world is $100 trillion. The ocean economy is a very important ocean economy. As, as we said at the start, two to three trillion US dollars. If you look at the science that's needed to support that decision making, to support those conversations. The global investment in research and development globally is not too bad, it's two trillion. But only 1% of that, roughly, is um, provided into ocean research. So you're really talking about a very, very heavy investment of research into land, let's say land atmosphere, and very little in going into the ocean. Um, compare that to space exploration, 100 billion US dollars, arms race 2 trillion. I now lead the, the ocean observations uh, work under the Global Ocean Observing System. That involves instruments and people and ships and Argo floats and gliders and instruments on animals and um, all of this sort of research investment and people to provide the data and the data flow and the data analysis into data centers that provide that into, into the sort of wider models and research and decision making. That's about one billion. And I have a very small budget and a very small team to try and help me coordinate all of that. So I'm really looking at how we can build this conversation under, uh, on uh, the needs around 
delivering ocean observation for, for decision making and that how we can really try and build this understanding at the national level to, to invest in this very important conversation that's, that's been missing very much from the climate change conversation. And if you think about it, your investment now will bring back you know, eight to 10 terms in terms of cost. So it's, it is a very important investment, but it's out of mind for a lot of people. There are many places for ocean action. There's many examples. I won't go into them, I haven't got the time. But this slide shows you some of the conversations that need to be had and where we need to invest that conversation and scientific research to support all of that, um, that sort of work in the global economy and the ocean economy. So what do we do now? We need to base decision making on the ocean. This information is vital for climate change. This is the, the nexus in which I'm working. The need to understand ocean changes, to provide that information for mitigation and adaptation, to provide weather forecasting, um, to increase resilience because the coastal zone is really where it's at when it comes to climate change, sea level rise, ecosystems, um, ports, um, shipping, fishing, so on and so forth. And within that space, of course, we need to protect nature. We need to be biodiversity neutral, biodiversity positive if possible, and provide that information for climate resilient ocean planning that we really need. The solutions are there. Um, research shows that ocean-based um, mitigation solutions could provide 35% emissions reductions through um, reducing um, emissions from shipping, through uh, renewables, through um, farming, through um, aquaculture and sustainable fisheries and so on and so forth, through blue carbon ecosystems and providing blue carbon credits that way. The adaptation solutions are there. This is an example from uh, Stiert in, in, uh, in Somerset where there's been a, a, a regeneration of the salt marsh there in collaboration with the local people to protect from sea level rise. But also it provides input into the local economy because of the tourism generated and the opportunities that, that are provided now in that area. People are important. You are important when it comes to ocean and climate solutions. Um, there is the reason that this ocean climate conversation uh, was brought in very strongly within the climate change conversation and negotiations was through a whole range of collaboration. Um, the ocean community is a very friendly one. I suggest you, you get involved with them. They're great people to work with. And um, there is a group here really looking at um, building through the Marrakesh Partnership under the UNFCCC, through the Ocean and Climate Platform, really driving some of this conversation around where are the solutions around marine, they have, they're called the ocean breakthroughs. This is something that they'll be delivering at uh, you know, conversations they'll be having at COP28 this year around marine conservation, shipping, aquatic food, renewable energy, coastal tourism, and all with a drive to better understand the cost benefits of investment into the ocean and climate conversation and the work in that space. I'm working at IOC now, which is the lead uh, organization for the uh, ocean decade. The science we need for the ocean we want is that motto. They have 10 challenges. Uh, I'm particularly interested in number seven, which is developing the ocean observing system. That's my, that's my bag. That's my uh, uh, directions I'm coming from. And if you like, this, this iceberg illustration shows the huge amount of work that, that needs to be done to provide the information to, to countries around what and how they now need to act on the ocean. Um, so we need observations and data collection. We need to bring that into a very open data management and sharing to deliver to the models for, for, for um, understanding the climate system, to deliver to the indicators to monitor adaptation, to bring together those, those um, variables that are needed to, to constrain the understanding of the carbon cycle for, for mitigation and so on and so forth. All of these end user applications are extremely important. I'm leading also the, the, decade, uh, the decade collaborative uh, center for, uh, office, sorry, for, for ocean observing, sort of on the left side there. And what we are doing very much is building the observation system for the future, for climate, for nature, for forecasting, 
uh, really dr driving this understanding of a, a system that currently is running off research that really needs to be driven by countries and governments to recognize how important it is to, to build an observing system that gives you, if you like, the, the raw ingredients to do the decision making. You can't manage what you do not measure. So we started really at Paris when not really, there was not really much talk about the ocean. We've evolved a little bit. Now there are mandates under the UNFCCC for countries to, to not just talk about ocean action, but to include it in their national goals and to, in the implementation of those goals. We need now to, to we're not there yet. The, the motto that uh, uh, really has been generated within this work is ocean action is climate action. But where do we go to now? Um, COP28 is coming up tomorrow. Um, uh, the global stock take that's, that's happening in the, in the Paris Agreement is really bringing in the conversation around ocean, and I hope very much that one of the uh, ambition elements coming out of that global stock take work is to recognize the power of ocean action for climate change. Countries really need to bring these different conversations to co-design these information together to really recognize the information that they need to do the action that is needed within the ocean for fisheries, for really climate resilient marine spatial planning that's sustainable, that's nature positive, that really m matches what they're actually said they would do. The ocean panel, of which the UK is one of them, have committed to 100% um, climate resilient uh, EZs, EZ, sorry. So they really need to um, understand how that works and what that looks like moving forward. And um, with that, I will say thank you very much. And what I want to do is to really encourage everybody in the room to think about how to, to work in this space. There's very little investment in ocean. There's very little investment in ocean science. But it needs people. It's a very friendly place to work. And I encourage all of you to think about careers in this uh, conversation to really build this uh, future that we really need for a, for a 100% sustainably managed ocean, not just within EEZs, but beyond national jurisdiction as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, for a really... Um inspiring and alarming in equal measure uh, speech, if I can put it like that. Um, we just go... So one thing that struck me was um, a couple of you mentioned that big statistic, the 2.3 trillion that um, the ocean brings to the world economy. And I got to thinking, because I'm a comms person, what does that actually boil down to? And it essentially means if the ocean was a country, it would be the eighth biggest economy in the world. And that's something to think about. So although Joe was saying that the ocean is missing from the climate conversation, the ocean certainly isn't missing from the global economy. And um, this is a really kind of rough sketch, and I, I'm sure we can all enrich it and think of um, other things to add to it. But this is just a few of the ways in which um, we're connected intimately to the ocean and, and what it provides for us. So I think you've got the traditional uh, industries there, the fishing, the tourism, some of which Joe, Joe mentioned. You've got the, the newer, if I can put it like that, the newer um, wind farms. And then you've got this really um, almost like a new frontier that we're hearing quite, quite a lot about in the ocean space now, which is deep sea mining. Um, you know, lots of companies thinking now for these rare metals that, um, you know, we're all reliant on for new technology. Are they going to be found in the sea? And there's a lot of controversy about that and the environmental impacts of that as well. So... Thinking about our fishing sector, um, the fishing sector isn't just an economic benefit. I think that's really important to remember. It's hundreds of millions of livelihoods are dependent upon it and support it. But it's also really important as well for our health um, because the 
seafood that's harvested from our ocean actually provides about 20% of the protein intake of people around the world. So when we think about the ocean, we should think about not just wealth, but also health as well, and what that provides for us. Ocean in crisis, I think Joe mentioned a few things in relation to that, particularly relating to climate. But I'm going to touch on a couple of the other challenges, biodiversity for sure, but a few of the other challenges facing the ocean. So um, the biodiversity challenge uh, that Joe touched upon is huge. It's partly because the ocean is a huge part of the planet. It covers most of the Earth. Much of it is unmapped, and much of it is unknown. And as I guess we're in Donald Rumsfeld territory of uh, known unknowns. But we literally don't know what the full scale of biodiversity in the ocean is. But we do know of the uh, mammals and creatures that live in the ocean, a huge number of them, whether they're sharks or whales or, or even smaller creatures or vulnerable habitats, those are actually at risk and, um, you know, at risk of extinction. And one of the reasons that there's such difficulty with biodiversity is relating to my sector, actually, overfishing. So um, overfishing is a real contributor to biodiversity loss, partly because of some of the damaging uh, fishing practices. Um, and also just the fact that um, fishers catch lots of different uh, species in their nets. Um, so there's a big challenge in reducing the amount of bycatch that's actually caught. So that's been a big contributor to biodiversity loss. And then there's the climate change challenge. Uh, Joe's centred on that. Um, the ocean temperature is rising. Um, it's contributing to marine heat waves. Um, if we think about this in relation to global fish stocks, um, it means that entire fish, fish stops can be wiped out in severe, severe events, and that will take literally decades to, to recover. But more generally, I think we're also seeing that fish are moving around the globe. Um, so they're moving from the tropics, and they're moving north, and they're moving south into cooler waters. What that means is that the traditional ways that we have of governing fishing in the ocean, whether it's through um, regional fishery management organizations or through setting quotas, are going to be really under pressure in, in, in the future. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, we're going to need governments uh, to even more cooperate and collaborate around how we manage these ocean resources. And just to kind of bring through what that actually means, um, I was talking to a Dutch fisherman um, a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling me that instead of catching his traditional species now, what was turning up in, in his nets were lobsters and squid. And he said to me, I used to think that kind of stuff just got flown in from France, uh, from Spain. So I think that tells you just how much fishers are seeing actually the change on the water and how they're experiencing it firsthand. Um, oh, sorry, I keep rolling back on this thing. Um, so, overfishing challenge. This is the, the core challenge that my organization, the Marine Stewardship Council, takes on. Um, and I think if you look at this graph, um, you will see that over the past 50 years, things haven't gone well. Um, the top bar essentially shows that more and more fish stocks around the world um, are being overfished. It's not all bad news. Um, the most commercially um, available species are actually more and more sustainably produced. So that's very good news, and I'll, I'll go on to talk about that in the future in, in a little bit. But overall, the trend is that um, fish stocks are more and more overfished. And that presents huge challenges to, to the ocean. And partly that is because of this, which is the population growth challenge. So we have 10 million people going to be on this earth in 2050. And we're going to have huge pressures on our food systems. Um, and for seafood consumption, it's, uh, it's a food stuff that's becoming increasingly popular. It's low calorie. It's uh, low, low carbon. Um, People are very interested in eating more food and less, and more seafood and less meat now. 
Um, and so we're going to see more and more pressure to produce from our oceans. A lot of that is going to be produced by aquaculture, but actually wild fisheries are going to be a big component of it as well. Sorry, I'm really... Right, okay. MSE and the blue economy. So um, the Marine Stewardship Council is uh, the biggest uh, sustainable fishing program in the world. Uh, we work with 674 fisheries globe, globally, um, and uh, that amounts to 19% of uh, the wild cat, marine catch in the world, and it's uh, 66 countries globally that we work in. Um, and we work with small-scale fisheries and bigger industrial fisheries, so every, everything from Seattle to the Southern Ocean. So the important thing to realize about MSE is although we have that scale, we're an entirely voluntary program. Um, we don't, uh, we're not backed by governments. We don't have big donor funds coming in. We don't have UM funding or anything like that. We are an entirely market-driven program. And what that means to, to bring it home is really, it's the demand from people like you, consumers, as well as retailers, that really drives that change on the water, that creates that demand for fisheries to change their practices to deliver um, sustainable seafood. And so when people talk about sustainable seafood, I often think that it's a bit of a name, but nobody really understands what it means. So, so at heart, sustainable fishing essentially leads to more fish in the sea. We know from research that's been done that fish that are, are fished sustainably, actually the stocks become more plentiful and more abundant, so literally there's more fish in the sea. As you can see from this, that's not an um, animation, by the way, that's a real picture of, a, of fish stocks. And the other thing to think about when we think about sustainable fishing is it's not just about the fish, it's about the much wider ocean and that biodiversity challenge that I talked about earlier. So um, at MSC, if you're certified to the MSC standard, it's not just about the stock that you're fishing, it's also about the wider environment. So you have to take care of endangered, threatened, and protected species, so that could be sharks or turtles or so on, and also vulnerable habitats. And I think what we see in the program is that this drives a lot of innovation. Um, it drives um, the uptake of technology. So, for example, we have fisheries which, um, you know, work with scientists, actually, to uh, map the seafloor, um, as well as try innovations like LED lights on uh, nets to get rid of porpoises that might get caught in nets. So I think having a biodiversity objective within the standard really helps drive innovation and helps protect that wider ocean. So when we're thinking about blue foods and what's good for the environment and trying to, you know, kind of um, almost square some of these almost seemingly conflicting challenges that we face, how do we feed the planet but have climate-friendly uh, systems, it's worth talking about blue food as um, a carbon-friendly um, option. Um, so carbon emissions from seafood are significantly lower than that of red meat production. Um, and I think this is, a, this is a, a coming area. There's a lot more interest, more scientific, nutritional interest in what we can do with the oceans. But, of course, what's essential is that whatever we do, it has to be sustainable. Because no point, as I pointed out earlier, in having a lot more seafood being eaten if it's not sustainable. Um, and that brings me to you, as uh, Joe was saying, we can all make a difference. Um, so when you are in supermarkets, you might notice the blue label on cans or packs. Um, when you buy something with a blue label, you're actually supporting fishers that are making a difference in the ocean. And it's as simple as that. You know, that's what you get when you go into a supermarket and you have that choice. That's incredibly empowering. And just remember what I said about our program. We're not government-backed. We don't get UN funds. So it's reliant on you and businesses to support it. 
And it is absolutely incredible, I think, the scale of the program based on that voluntary market uh, focused solu solution. And I just wanted to give you a little snapshot of um, the different products. Uh, we have 20,000 products, uh, product lines on, on shelves at the moment. And uh, our kind of heartland is actually in Europe. That's where it started. Our sustainability um, messages landed there first. But you know, we're increasingly seeing products on shelves in the US and also Japan. So this is, this is a global trend. And we know from our con consumer research that uh, more and more consumers are interested in sustainability and having options that work for the planet. And that just kind of underlines what I'm saying, really, that um, we have uh, a market that's worth 12 billion, uh, and that's growing every year. So I think that's fantastic, and again, shows the power, people power, with the power of the consumer. But I think the other thing to highlight is um, it's not that a solution like MSC can work by itself. I think what Joe showed is that we need multiple solutions across lots of different uh, you know, disciplines, uh, scientific, academic, business, um, environment, to, to, to help push forward the ocean agenda. Um, but crucially, we also really need governments to act as well. Governments must be absolutely foot, front and center of the solution. Because we need, as a sustainable, working in sustainable fishing, to have an enabling environment to work against. So, for example, um, you know, some of the richest nations in the world at the moment can't actually agree to set scientific quotas for some of the most commercially valuable um, stocks um, in the world. And that's a real problem, because if they continue setting unscientific quotas, they will be heading towards a, a stock crash. And that everybody will lose out from that, local communities, consumers, and so on. So we need an enabling environment from, from governments. And I guess the last point I'd make is that, you know, as I sketched at the beginning, um, the ocean economy is a huge one, lots of different players in it. But I think if we're just looking at fishing and sustainable fishing, this is how it can support uh, global progress because it's not just about supporting the ocean and putting the ocean front and center, it's also about supporting us. Um, it's about supporting us tackle the challenges of hunger. It's about us uh, helping us support um, the economies and livelihoods that we need. So I think if we're talking and thinking about fishing and the transition that we need to make to sustainable fishing, it's about how can we make this a win-win. It is a win-win for both us and the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna and Ishbel. That was wonderful to get that perspective on the blue economy. And thank you to all of you for showing up today and for those of you who are online. So it's really interesting when you're talking about the ocean economy. Everybody has their image of the ocean, but it's really hard to explain sometimes what some of those contexts are. So I work as a visiting professor in practice here with the London School of Economics, but I also work a lot with different companies around the world. And one of the things that I try to do is I go and speak to all different groups, it's sometimes banks, it's sometimes schools, and talk about the blue economy. But we don't have really good resources to try to explain these things. So this is part of why we're having a public event tonight, to engage you on the research that's happening at London School of Economics, but also to inspire future action. So when I joined with LSE, a really great uh, young person in Singapore said to me, how can I help you 
communicate. So she does drawings. She's a science communicator and she's an illustrator and artist. And so one of the explainers that I did for the London School of Economics here, I published it in March, was about the importance of the ocean economy, which we've just heard Jayana and Ishbel really explain to us. And so Sian Wu, she works with the Weird in the Wild. She started this organization to help to illustrate and communicate scientific concepts. And I wanted to share some of those illustrations with you here today. And starting with this idea that we need to think, dream, and act in blue. And here are some of the things that we mean. So we've got the the planet here, and that image of the blue marble, which was taken from Apollo 17 space mission, it really showed that actually the Earth is more blue than it is green, and that if we're going to solve some of these climate change challenges, we really need to look at to the oceans. And the oceans do so much, and we can see here the images of the biodiversity in the oceans, that it forms a key part of the water cycle, and that it contributes a huge amount to the economy, which we've heard today, but that it's sometimes lacking in governance, and that's why we need to have the concentration on some of the treaties, and we've heard some of that from Joanna, and we'll hear a little bit more from Siva later, about the UN High Seas Treaty. <coughs> but also that we need governance to support the ocean economy, because there's so many different aspects of the ocean economy, and we need to understand how they all interact. So we can't have a healthy fishery if we have perhaps deep sea mining nearby. How are we going to have coastal tourism if it's suddenly impacted by maybe energy uh, development? And so how can we start to look at all of those different sectors interacting? And even more importantly, how can we start to drive finance into the blue economy? So out of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, actually SDG 14, Life Below Water, attracts the least funding. And so what are the kinds of things that we need to do to attract more funding? We have different collaborations. So the Poseidon Principles, which are illustrated here, are for the maritime shipping industry. So the International Maritime Organization has actually set goals for decarbonisation of that sector. And do we need to look at other sectors who can work that way? What are the tools that we need to start bringing further collaboration for the ocean economy? And so finally, if we truly understood the role that oceans play in climate change, biodiversity, our lives, transport and energy, maybe we'd use blue as the colour of hope for our future. So these are the kinds of illustrations. Please do have a look online uh, to see more about this comic. And now we want to go to a panel discussion. We've got amazing expertise here today. And so I wanted to introduce uh, two panellists who will be joining us now. Dr. Siva Tempesetti, thank you for joining us, is an Associate Professor of Law at the London School of Economics with a research and policy interest in the use and circulation of genetic resources and intellectual property law. Dr. Tempesetti attended the Intergovernmental Negotiations on the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, or BBNJ Treaty, first as an advisor to the Pacific Small Island Developing States, and second as an expert chair on the G77 Chairs team in 2022 and 2023. She currently leads a project on the interpretation and implementation of the treaty. Second panellist joining us, we have Dr. John Sidon, is the Chief Scientist and Director of Data, Science and Technology at the National Oceanography Centre. Since joining the NOC in 2020, John has championed the embedding of digital approaches to furthering science. Prior to joining NOC, John held positions at the Met Office, where he was the Head of Ocean Forecasting R&D Department Group and the co-chair of the National Partnerships for Ocean Prediction. His personal research was on developing ocean models with a focus on interactions between the ocean and atmosphere and understanding how those interactions underpin predictability for climate and high impact events. Please join me in welcoming the rest of our panel. On to the questions uh, now. Perhaps if I can turn to Joanna first. I'll just lean forward. 
Do you think that the oceans have had enough prominence in discussions about climate change and climate risk thus far? Okay, um, so I think it's probably obvious. Uh, my answer is definitely a no. Um, if you like, my, from my presentation, where they weren't even in consideration uh, 10 years ago, we've come a long way. Uh, so under the climate change agreement, certainly um, countries are now mandated to consider ocean within their climate change goals, their national climate change goals and, and the implementation of those goals. That was the mandate coming out of COP27 last year. And then um, obviously with the, with the UN decade for ocean science for sustainable development, there has been a huge increase through that, through uh, the UNFCCC uh, work on ocean, through other inter uh, multilateral agreements, um, BBNJ we'll hear about, but also the um, Convention of Biological Diversity um, have their um, 2020 agenda now, which looks uh, definitely at, at uh, increasing um, marine protected areas, so 30 by 30. So we are move. We have moved the, along the path, but we are still at very early stages. We really need to go now from this recognition of the importance of the ocean into the how, and to make sure that this commitment by countries, including the high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy, are, are, are transforming to this climate-resilient marine spatial planning, considering fisheries, considering ecosystems, considering this wealth of activity that takes place in, in the coastal zones and, and beyond um, borders. And that has to be driven from, from the nation, so it has to be done within, within sort of standard setting that can be guided by um, UN organizations, but the UN functions as a, as a party-driven process. So we have to now show the next step, the how-to, and the, the economic benefits of, uh, of action within this space. How about our other panellists? John? Yeah, I agree, of, of course, with everything Joe said. But I think there's one uh, particular emphasis that I think is important that we need to think about. So we, we very often talk about the importance of sustain, sustainability for protecting our ocean, and, uh, and of course that is absolutely critical. But perhaps one way of engaging people more and something people perhaps don't realise enough about is the role that ocean plays in impacting on, on humans. And, th and that, that feedback of, of the way that we're damaging the ocean it comes back and kicks us because because the ocean is is perhaps invisible but it's not not present in our lives um, is is really important so that would be my biggest question here is can we get people to understand the importance of the ocean not in its own right because that's of course critical but also for us uh, so for example we're in London the one of the biggest changes to improving the weather forecast over in London over the recent years has been incorporating ocean information in our weather forecast you you, you won't feel that but it's present in our everyday lives, and I think that's a really important message. Um, so I've been thinking about the oceans for the last five to six years, but I've avoided the climate. So I think that's quite telling. So my work on genetic resources uh, on the Oceans Treaty is, um, you know, on, on the one hand, it's very detailed. The treaty is a big multilateral win, uh, but the references to climate change, um, I think uh, I, I did a control F, there are about five, seven references in all of the treaty. Uh, what is interesting though, and I think quite significant, is that it is now part of the definition of cumulative impacts. So climate change associated biodiversity loss, for instance, because of ecosystem degradation, um, is now connected in this treaty, which I think is an enormous step forward. Um, I'm not sure we got as much as we would have liked to see to have real impact, but at least now there's a new forum in which these interconnected conversations uh, about ecosystem resilience um, can be had uh, internationally. So. Great, thank you. Ishba? I, I think the thing that I often think about is it's not just climate. You know, in a way you've got a converging set of you know, really big challenges. It's popular, you know, as I was saying there, it's population uh, growth, it's biodiversity challenges, some of which are associated with climate and some of which are separate. And I think that the challenge for the ocean isn't just a climate one, and that's the truth of it. You know, there's a set of intersecting um, challenges. And I think that's what's going to make it difficult because we've got some, I think we're going on to talk about new treaties and governance around it. Um, you know, 
as I said um, earlier, we need international agreements on how to govern the oceans because the, the, it's the ultimate common good um, and it can't just be from one perspective. I think, you, you know, it's also about climate but it's also about biodiversity and ultimately it's about livelihoods and as you're saying, you know, how do we get the buy-in of people who are dependent on the oceans to help them make the changes that need to happen? It's such a good point, and the oceans are definitely you know, a classic example of the tragedy of the commons, that people don't own the oceans. So, Sibra, we'll come back to you talking about, you know, there's some big new treaties. You, you know, worked on the BBNJ and the your new High Seas Treaty. You know, we had COP15 last year, Biodiversity Treaty. How do you think these are going to influence how we manage the oceans? Yeah, so um, I'm very pleased to be talking at LSE about the, this question because, again, I think it's not something that has had a lot of sustained academic attention. So the new treaty that was agreed in March of this year is BBNJ, the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty. So when Joanna mentioned the ocean is missing, uh, what is even more absent is talk of areas beyond national jurisdiction. So you'll know that um, there's an EEZ zone that surrounds every sovereign coastal state, which extends to about 200 uh, miles um, from the coast. Beyond this area uh, is the ocean that is not covered under any sovereign territory. And this comprises two-thirds of the oceans, and which is about half of the Earth's surface. So a treaty to govern biodiversity over half of the Earth's surface is an amazing achievement and um, a very hard one achievement as well. So just very briefly, the treaty has four parts to it, one on marine genetic resources, one on ABMTs or area-based management tools, um, EIAs, environmental impact assessment and capacity building uh, and technology transfer. So um, the part that I worked on, perhaps I can say a little bit about that because We've talked a little bit about the health of the oceans, perhaps not so much about the wealth in biodiversity of the oceans. We've spoken about fishing, but uh, the treaty was very concerned about marine genetic resources. Now, why is this important? Because marine genetic resources could potentially lead to climate resilient technology. So, a uh, very hypothetical example, and excuse the caricaturing here, if you find an extremophile in, in the deep sea that can live under conditions of extreme heat or pressure, potentially you have a genetic trait that might be used uh, to develop um, crop, um, uh, drought-resistant crops, for instance. It could be the source of new antivirals, for example. So the, this part of the negotiation of the treaty was driven by a lot of interest in what could be developed from the high seas. And just, I mean, when there are economic interests at stake, things can get very contentious. So agreement on genetic resources uh, was widely considered to be holding up agreement on the treaty in March, and that we were able to finally finalize the text of the treaty is um, to quite a large part down to developing countries plus China, which is the group of G77 plus China, pulling together and forming consensus on marine genetic resources that they can then negotiate on. So this multilateral win, um, the role that developing countries played in this, um, I think means, generates quite a lot of goodwill. Um, it's quite a perilous situation now, while we should celebrate the treaty, there is also peril because the future of this international legal treaty is going to be domestic and how it's implemented domestically. So what we, I think a challenge really is to take the intent, the good intent, the purpose of construction of this treaty into domestic legislation and implementation, which um, is a whole new challenge. Some of this requires new research, um, conceptual thinking, new institutions. Um, so there's a lot of work for everybody. Now, before we came on stage, we were talking a little bit about the role of the developing states here. Could you explain a little bit more about how important it is to make sure that they are heard in, in all of these treaties and what their role is? Um, yes, of course. So, um, it's, it's possible, because this is a treaty about biodiversity, it is possible that um, 
a state that is mega biodiverse rich, for instance, that's uh, has a coastal area that's quite adjacent to areas beyond national jurisdiction. Now, the the field of marine scientific research on the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction is very unequal. Um, so the areas beyond national jurisdiction are sites of great inequality, partly because the legal norm that drives activities on areas beyond national jurisdiction is freedom of the high seas, which translates really as do what you can, which again translates often into over-extraction and overuse. So moving from that sort of regime to a regime where we can see the resources, the biodiversity of the areas beyond national jurisdiction as working for all in terms of common interest. So you're moving from freedom of activity to status of the legal status of resources. Right? So it's quite a big jump. So you want to move from freedom to do anything you want to saying, look, these resources need to be managed in for common good. Um, and this is why in spite of not having any sovereign interest in this area, we have enormous interest from state parties to come together to negotiate an agreement on how the, how the biodiversity will be uh, governed and treated. Of course, a large part of this is also to consider things like uh, MPAs, so managed uh, protected areas on the high seas where biodiversity can be conserved and possibly sustainably used. Um, the interesting part about the treaty is that it does not set goals or targets. Compliance in the treaty is going to be mostly based on information generation. Um, and developing countries to feel a part, to truly meaningfully be a part of treaty mechanisms are going to need a lot of help in terms of capacity building, technology transfer, to participate in these mechanisms. And therefore, while the achievement of the treaty um, is something certainly to be noted. It's very significant. It is only the first step. So Joanna's uh, talk was, um, you know, you saw how those challenges are interconnected. Um, there's very little information that can then go into implementation of the treaty. So I think taking 134 countries plus China along in the implementation challenge is going to be extremely important, not just for legitimacy of the treaty, but more importantly, perception of legitimacy of the treaty. Um, yeah, so I think um, you're touching on a kind of interesting issue. So first of all, it's got to go down to country level. So that's a challenge in itself. Um, and then I think the other challenge about these uh, conventions is, and they were hard won, right? You know, they were negotiated over many years, like decades, some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, huge step forward. But I think the challenge is the implementation challenge. But it's also um, about the scope of some of the measures. You, you know, on the High Seas Treaty and the CBD Treaty, the... Um, the MPA requirement is 30% of... Um, you know, the marine territory be set aside for MPAs. And I think one of the things that's going to be really important to the success of these treaties is not just seeing them as conservation measures, but seeing them as sustainable development measures. Because if you don't involve local communities, as, as I've said before, or um, you don't recompense people for um, taking away the rights of their, to use those resources, then it's going to be very difficult to see um, some of the, the ambition of these treaties come into reality. Um, and my last point is, and I'd be interested to hear about Joe's point on this as well, is that my concern is about the speed of change. Like We see that in the ocean, right? You're an ocean expert as well. Um, we see it in fishing, literally fishermen seeing that they're actually not catching the same fish any longer. How can the governance processes keep up this multilateral process, this unwieldy process? How can it actually keep up with what's actually changing on the planet? That, that's my concern with, with this, really. It's so true. I mean, fishermen give you feedback straight away yeah. about the changes that they're seeing. And yet, as mm. you say, these treaties take very long time to negotiate. Any further comments on that? Many, but I, I try and keep to time. Um, um, I think uh, what, what's interesting perhaps for the audience to know um, about the UN that people perhaps don't realise is that the UN doesn't have any um, power to make 
countries do things. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the agreements, BBNJ, UNFCCC, they've worked because the fact is that the nations have agreed what they will do together globally, but with um, national, um, you know, with, with the, the national context in mind. To get um, so, for example, under the climate change agreement, it works because they have nationally determined contributions, and then they report on what they've done into this sort of like multilateral process. But the UN cannot turn around and finger point, um, and cannot make them do things. And, and we know that the UNFCCC has been going since '92, and, and you know emissions are still going up. So it's it's it, it's not it is and isn't working. Is 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 sort of short term. But what we have to work with these processes because these processes give the context in which you know the, the, they can be countries can be held accountable to what they have agreed to do. So there has to be checks and measures in place and indicators in, in place by scientists, by the scientific community, research community, shall I say, because it's 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 not just the the, the chemical, physical, biological sciences; it's social, political. And, and legal context as well that can really understand, you know, what is being done and can provide information into that into that decision making space to hold these countries accountable. And the FCCC, for example, has a global stock take this year, which is intended to push ambition around to the next uh, round of nationally determined contributions. So I think that that's a very important first point. The second point was exactly the speed. The intergovernmental process goes extremely slowly. BBNJ took 10 years to agree. UNFCCC, uh, you know, took a similar length of time. Um, and yet, even what's agreed, it's not living up to what the countries have agreed to. So there has to be this sort of, like, uh, way to, to move. We know that industry, for example, is moving a lot faster mm. in terms of building CDR, fishing. Yeah. Um, fishing is sort of... Re fish fisheries are recognizing this sort of move of species away from tropical regions and if climate change continues to 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 uh, increase then we, we're going to have we already have deoxygenation zones so there's going to be huge dead zones in the ocean where there's going to be nothing at all so so the, this 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 is really a, the big challenge now is how we work with these multilateral processes and yet move at a speed that's really um, powerful enough to, to make the changes that, that uh, this sort of societal information and the societal challenges demand. Um, and so we have to work with all stakeholders. We have to work with industry. We have to build these sort of like um, co-produce the, the information needed that is provided to governments. They have to set the, the standards and, the, and, the, and the, the legal context in which we operate, but there has to be a sort of co-produced um, process together that's really, really important. So anybody in the room, interdisciplinary and co-benefits and bringing in stakeholders at the start of any conversations about how we move forward is extremely important. I mean, just briefly, you mentioned the global stock take. Are we expecting to see anything in the global stock take about the oceans? I'm, I'm hoping. I have no influence on it. <laughs> it's a party-driven process. Um, but there has been a, a big move now with, with the mandates coming out of the last two COPs to, to, and, and the, the dialoguing that's now going on about the, the importance of ocean climate action to, to see that... And, and the work that I, I presented, which is, you know, 35% of emission reductions could come through ocean-based action. We need to think about, you know, um, these, these uh, resilience processes because of extreme events. We need to think about, you know, what's, what's happening in terms of extremes. Uh, small island developing states, least developed countries are at the, the sharp end of the, of the, the climate change knife. And, and the um, fund, the loss and damage fund, which is being discussed in the FCCC, is, is one of the conversations that's happening at COP this year also about the, the, the funding that could be available for these countries because of these extreme events that are happening. Um, and, and sea level rise, which is, you know, which is just a war of attrition, um, is, is, is really a, a conversation that, that should be more at the fore. So true. John, I wanted to talk to you to ask you about advancements in science and technology. I mean, how can that help shape the ocean economy? And maybe to highlight where we've got some gaps currently. Yeah. Um, so I thought a bit about this question when, when you framed it earlier. And, and I think probably the easiest way to describe where we're at is probably to take us back uh, 150 years. So 150 years ago, pretty much exactly now, uh, a repurposed Navy ship called the Challenger 
set sail and it, it was the moon landing of its time. It was the biggest science expedition that, that, that had ever happened and it was for a very long time after that. And what they were attempted to do is to uncover, the, uncover what was happening in the deep. Uh, and they were at sea for four years. It was an enormous effort. They, uh, it, they did a whole load of things that look very much like the oceanography we do today, actually. There's, in some ways, n not, nothing much has very, very much has changed. Uh, someone mentioned earlier um, deep sea mining and manganese nodules. They were the first, it was the first expedition to discover manganese nodules, for example. The, the tran the, we're at the transition period at the moment for oceanography, I would say. So, so, so the, we have largely con continued to do oceanography in the same way, going out with ships, uh, throwing some instruments over 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 the, over the side of the ship, picking up some water, taking samples, uh, and so on. Uh, and someone I, re I read a really nice book recently, uh, Helen Sersky's book around uh, the, uh, the blue planet. I think she called it or blue 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 mission. And she described that original Challenger expedition as trying to reproduce the Sistine Chapel by placing 300 points on the Sistine Chapel and extrapolating between them. But then thinking that the Sistine Chapel is actually moving all in, in moving in time. That's the sort of scale of what we're trying to do: is putting little pinpricks in the ocean that is continuously moving. So how do we how do we expand the number of pinpricks we can um, we can put in the ocean? So something transformative happened in the 90s. We satellite oceanography came about. We have we were able to see from the space, but satellite oceanography only sees the surface micron or a few millimeters of the ocean. The transformation that we're seeing now is we can stick various bits of instruments in, in the deep ocean, probably for extended periods of time now, autonomy is, is really a, a big deal. Big data is coming, so we've got the digital elements. We're starting to develop sensors that can do chemistry remotely on a chip. So that there are massive changes going on, but I cannot understate the scale of the problem. I mean, when people say the ocean is big, it is dramatically big, it's dramatically big. You know, we, we see these, I'm afraid, goose, I'm sorry, the Global Ocean Observing System, we see these pictures of the ocean of observation, we see this big, big fat dot in the middle of the ocean, we say there's an observation there. That big fat dot is a tiny, minuscule little thing. Um, and so we've got to find novel technologies to scale up our, we've got to unmask the ocean, we've got to be able to see into it, because what, you can't protect what you can't see, and you can't, uh, you can't understand what you're going to do next if you can't predict, and you can't predict if you can't see. So all these things are there to support all sorts of uh, industries. So, so right now, for example, deep sea mining uh, is, is a really content, content, contentious space. And I, I think I'd like to make an, uh, a point about the role of science as, a, as an independent assurance uh, activity. It's really, really important that the scientists that are involved have really clear uh, differentiation between themselves and the industries that are working so that we can be seen to be independent advisors, giving the best possible advice without fear or favour of any influence from government, from, from industry, from, from anyone else. That's a critical thing. Uh, so we're trying quite hard to, uh, to span that space, but deep sea mining is really challenging us because it's a really contentious space to be working in. Well, how, how do we deal with that? Well, we deal with that by saying, well, the important role of science here is to gather the data, to pick, pick out the, the un, uh, unintended consequences, understand the perverse mechanisms that happen because someone tries to do something like geoengineering is another uh, subject we ought to touch on. Geoengineering geo scares me because people, engineers have a long history of coming up with great solutions that once you put them in place don't necessarily reflect. Uh, Could you just don't. briefly explain what you mean by geoengineering? Ge ge so geoengineering is, is in some way uh, changing the environment in a way to solve some of the problems we have. So some examples that I've heard recently are uh, seeding clouds, so that we don't. So there's there's less uh, radiation, radiative forcing on the ocean, or radiative forcing on the earth. So we can we reduce the heating, but of course we don't know what will happen once once those clouds have been seeded. You need the scientists to work through the very complex and uh, challenging uh, interactive feedbacks to understand that. Absolutely the same with deep sea mining. We've got to go out there. We've got to understand the biodiversity. People think that the deep sea is is this sort of barren. Uh, wasteland, it's a desert. It's, it's massively biodiverse, there's an awful lot down there, but it's also very vulnerable, it's very sensitive, they have very narrow regimes in which they live, so even the slightest perturbation to that environment could destroy it for centuries, thousands of years. So understanding what the implications are uh, is the scientist's role. Then understanding what the, the pros and cons and the other, uh, and, and and the, 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 how you weigh up those, those disbenefits and benefits is, is for someone else to do. But without that unveiling the, what's going on in the background, what's going on in the deep, 
we will never be able to do that. And I, I really, I really worry actually that the, the whole idea of the blue economy is running far faster than we can actually understand the implications. Um, yeah, if I could come in here just briefly. So um, I'm just going to pick a point um, that John just mentioned about um, neutrality of science. And then I'm going to give you two examples from the treaty uh, to sort of explain my point. Um, so yes, ideally, science is neutral, it's objective, and there is one truth that scientists follow. But often, um, you know, we know that scientists can have conflicts of interest. We know that science can position itself in the service of certain interests. Now, it becomes quite difficult when you uh, say that prima facie science is neutral when that, and when that science also has to get translated into legal language. Um, between that neutral projection presentation of science and legal language that can be implemented, there can be quite a number of pitfalls. I want to give you two examples very quickly uh, from the treaty. Uh, one, we, uh, so one of the biggest problems for the last few decades in biodiversity governance is that we have no way of tracing where the genetic resources come from. Now, this has been a problem that has not been solved in the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, the BBNJ Treaty uh, introduces something called a batch identifier, which will I mean, if it is implemented as intended, could potentially solve this problem. And again, going back to what both of you mentioned about um, you can't manage what you can't measure, the idea would be that if you collect genetic resources from areas beyond national jurisdiction, you would have, through this identifier, a way to visualize where the resources were collected. Potentially, it's not just about uh, tracing genetic resources, it's also about the effic efficacy of treaty compliance that, that this, this sort of visualization could provide. And that is something that we now need data scientists uh, to work out, to work out how this would be uh, implemented, how to pull in private parties, state parties, and non-traditional decision makers, like groups of scientists who tend to be quite powerful uh, in this field. Another example is a lot of the treaty negotiation has been about going out to areas beyond national jurisdiction and collecting your genetic resources. It is possible now to remote sequence genetic resources. So there's no collection of physical samples, but the, but the data is, is uh, relayed back. So a lot of those liabilities that come from accessing the physical sample creating the digital sequencing information on the sample um, and managing that DSI on the sample um, is bypassed, which is again a challenge uh, for treaty implementation. Now, I think it's really critical that um, communities like John's, uh, the, the sort of um, epistemic communities which function as non-traditional decision makers around such a technical and complex treaty arrangement really come together to be an inclusive and representative voice, including of indigenous people and developing countries. So it doesn't mean just planting a scientist from the global south on your panel, but it means involving them in the research design of your projects, involving them in how data is managed, in how products that are produced, um, you know, who benefits from the products that are produced. Um, so it has to be a whole spectrum uh, sort of involvement for inclusivity to be to make sense in this context. John, yeah, to come yeah, I, I fully support everything you just said there, uh, and I didn't have a chance to go into details, but uh, but one of the revolutions that we're going through at the moment is the digital revolution. Data is becoming bigger, but it's also becoming more accessible, and we have to make it more accessible because we can't, we just won't be able to cope with the volumes without doing that. And there are concepts. Uh, uh, around how you share data that I think are fundamental to supporting this. So as a community, we are, we are uh, extremely focused on this idea of uh, uh, sharing, not only making the data available, making it usable, making it usable in a wide, wide context. So thinking about uh, the ethical elements of our data collection, not only how do you collect it and make sure you can use it, but how do you collect it and make sure everyone everywhere can use it. Uh, Joanne is very, very involved, and Joanne's community is very, very involved in this, and I'm, I'm personal, uh, it's an area I really personally care a lot about. That, that's a very, uh, that's a, there's an interface there between a, a real technology challenge, but, a, but an ethical and uh, possibly legal challenge as well. There are l many actors in this space that won't share data, 
So, for example, our institution will not work on scientific projects with people who will not allow us to share the data. That, that's that's our that's our one of our basic ethical principles because we believe if the data is not shared, it then becomes it it, it, it reduces the um, it reduces the, the the ethical frame framework in which we're in which we're working. Uh, so I think it's fundamental that we as scientists understand that importance of of not only being uh, beyond reproach but being clearly being being able to be seen to be neutral. Yes, and I think that transparency is so important. Now I want to give time for the audience, both here in the room and online, to ask some questions. I'm going to give one more quick round to the panel, so start thinking about what you would like to ask. Now, I'll come, Ishbel, I'll ask you this question uh, to lead on it. As countries, as individuals, as companies start to commit to net zero, we can see that some of the solutions are going to come from the oceans. I mean, what are things that you can ask of the audience here today that they can take actions on that can support the ocean economy? Well, that, that's uh, by the blue label. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm making a frivolous point, but um, as I said, you know, we have 670 fisheries around the world working with us, 19% of the wild marine catch. That is a voluntary program and it is entirely dependent on consumers and retailers stocking those products. So um, talk about it to your friends, you know, um, buy products that are ocean friendly. All of that actually does make a difference. Exert your power as a consumer um, to, to make a difference to the ocean. Um, the other thing I say, which is, you know, I think Joe picked up as well, is that sometimes it's easier for individuals and companies to move faster than governments, right? And we are seeing an amazing amount of innovation um, in fisheries, you know, moving to low-carbon solutions, the kind of technology that I was talking about to try and have um, less, you know, impact on the ocean environment. So all of that's there and all of that's possible. Sometimes I feel like, you know, the, the ideas are so huge and the challenges are so huge that we feel disempowered. But actually, you know, use your power as a, as a consumer to actually support businesses that are making a difference on the ocean would be my kind of um, top, top tip. What else? Joanna? Oh, um... I think the UK is doing quite well in offshore renewable energy, so I would encourage everyone to, to think where your energy supply is coming from. Um, second of all, you as individuals have voting power when it comes to elections. Uh, think about who you are voting for when, when that time comes. And thirdly, um, because there's many young people in the room, um, you have the opportunity, I think, to make a, a huge difference moving forward. There's a huge challenge facing you guys. Um, if you look at the IPCC report, you're going to be, you're heading into a world that is warmer than uh, hotter, with more challenges, with more people, with more conflict. Um, there is, it's, 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 it's a space that's very challenging, but there are things that are, I wouldn't have even dreamed of, um, when I was when I was younger, uh, I'll give you an example. I got my first mobile phone when I was 29. So there's, <laughs> I'm showing my age to the room. But I think the the opportunities for that that you have at your fingertips now in terms of the technologies uh, that John was referring to and the opportunities to to make a difference with where you take your careers is is a really powerful one. And um, I think uh, just from the, the conversations we've had this evening, really, really encourage you to, to think about working interdisciplinarily to bring people together, which you have the power to do so, to, to really build conversations that, are, that have to be done in, in a way that is, is working with, with other people to, to, to provide solutions into this space. All right. Collaborate. John? So I read a paper recently, which I, I think is a bit of a go-to quote of mine, and I can't remember the exact quote, quote of course, but it's Georgia Tale 2021, where they talk about the fact that the climate crisis is something that everyone agrees is, more or less everyone, is, is, is now sold on. But we as a science community have failed miserably to communicate uh, the implications, uh, the, the ramifications, uh, and what we, can, we, what we can do to try and support it. And therefore we get these um, malign actors 
who are who are occupying the solution space far more than than than, than we are. Uh, they're they're distorting the story. They're they're, they're making it. Uh, they're making it really hard to see the wood for the trees. So for me, the, the, the key thing we can do right now is create clarity to communicate well, to have some really clear advocacy around what we can do and what we need to do. And I think there are two sides to that. There, there, there's a science community like me that we need to really un understand how to communicate to people in this audience, other audiences. We've been rubbish at that. That's frankly the, the, the reality. Um, but I think there also there's, there's, a, there's a societal uh, obligation here to really try and sort out the noise, because there is a lot of noise, and come on guys, everyone knows that we're being fed a, a huge amount of misinformation. We need to sort that out, because people like me are struggling to get our voices heard, because that misinformation is drowning us out, and that makes it virtually impossible to us, okay. for us to make progress. Clear communication. I kind of forgotten the question, so it's about what can you do to... What can these to... people here in the room, we've heard consumer choice, yeah. we've heard yeah. political choice, Got it. Okay. Uh, we've heard clear communication, Yeah. anything um, Yeah, I, I mean, I, there's an African proverb, I don't know if it's African, but I think it's African, mm -hmm. that you can't wake up anybody, you can't wake up somebody who's pretending to be sleeping. Now, why do I say this? Um, I think we're very used to enclosures, of information, knowledge, technology, data, we take that as a given. We take it as a given that you can't benefit from something that cannot be attributed to you and owned by you. And I think in the policy space internationally, this has led to a lot of enclosure of knowledge and enclosure of technology. And this is a real problem when it comes to managing disasters, common catastrophes that we are going to see in the next decade or so. So if there was one thing I, I would encourage you to do is to consider whether you can work in more open frameworks, if you can share, if you can disseminate, if you can give away. Um, it may not have uh, impact initially, but in the long run, I think this is the only way we're going to find the innovative solutions that we need. It's a great point. I, I do like that quote. Uh, thank you. Okay, your turn. Now we have roving mics, so please raise your hand if you have a question and please wait until you receive one of the microphones to ask your question. I'm just looking around. Okay, I think the first hand I saw was the person in the black shirt uh, midway up. Uh, thanks to the panel for lots of hope and good stuff being done. My brother lives in North Wales. Two sperm whales washed up on his local beach. The aut autopsy confirmed that they both died. Their stomachs were full of plastic. The avian uh, bacterial illness that and viral illnesses affecting birds around Scotland and around the UK is born of waste that goes into, uh, untreated waste that goes into the sea. So my question to all of you really, is given that 600 million livelihoods depend on the sea, 20% uh, of protein for, for the world comes from the sea, is where, how are we going to have a credible response, an international response to disposing of plastic, managing the island that's the size of France in the Pacific, but also dealing with sewage waste and environmental waste from, from uh, in, industry, heavy industry? Okay. I'll take a second question before we come to the panel. The lady in grey that was there. There's someone in... Yes, the, the lady there. The person with the grey jumper. Okay, the person with the grey jumper. I didn't see the hand. Hi, thank you very much. Um, a question in the context of the MSC discussion we were having. Uh, you've mentioned a lot about uh, sustainable fishing. I was wondering if you still think today on a commercial size um, scale, you think sustainable fishing is a reality, especially in the context of, you said, you know, you represent about 19% of fisheries. When you have potentially 81% of fisheries that are overfishing, is there such a thing as sustainable fishing? And if so, what does that look like? What do you uh, implement to ensure that? Okay, thank you. We'll come back to our panel. So one on pollution, and particularly plastic pollution, and one on fisheries. 
would like to go first? I mean, I, I can take the plastics uh, question. So the BBNJ Treaty does have reference to plastic and plastic pollution. Um, why is this important? Because potentially if there is a... Um, it is possible to go to the ITLOS tribunal to get an advisory opinion on things that are emerging. So it's possible that under BBNJ something can be done if there was, if there was a proposal to do so. And I think uh, the negotiations of the Plastics Treaty, which from all accounts has been a bit of a failure, that might be an understatement, uh, that just passed in, in, in Kenya, um, uh, shows exactly many of the points that we've been talking about. It's about, um, you know, where is the science? Where is the consensus building around targets? Where is the mobilization um, on agreed goals, if not targets? Um, so plastics, I'm afraid, is another symbol of all that's wrong with multilateral negotiations. Then, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be another way of doing this. So one way would be to put pressure on our own state government, state parties, uh, to go with good proposals, to work intercessionally on things that can be done when you get to the room to negotiate, um, and to just have a, a very strong, robust agenda of, of intercessional work so that we can actually agree on certain things. Thank you. Ishbel, could I ask you on the fisheries? So, and just quickly on the plastics thing, um, one of the biggest sources of plastic is, of course, fishing gear, a discarded fishing gear, and that's actually one of the um, amendments that we've recently introduced at MSE, introducing kind of tougher requirements on... Uh, fisheries not to discard fishing gear, although as we know, um, you know, a lot of fishing gear, uh, a lot of fisheries don't actually want to lose their gear because it's so expensive. Um, so, and, and I think we are seeing much more momentum, a lot more public advocacy actually, um, on, you know, reform in fisheries, but also, you know, how uh, we dispose of plastic um, through our kind of... Um, you know, plastic disposal systems and so on. But it's, you know, huge issue, as you said. There's a whole raft of, um, an island of, of plastic out there. So you, you asked the question about, is sustainable fishing possible? Because, you know, our programme only manages 19%. And I guess my kind of answer is, yes, it is. But it requires um, governments to come in and back it. Because actually, some of the things that are in the MSC standard, they're not rocket science, they're really sound fisheries management principles. And that's about, you know, how you govern fisheries so that uh, they don't take too much out of the sea. Um, and, you know, you have to have, it's, it's a little bit like you were talking about, you know, you have to have an enabling environment from governments in order to move at scale. So I think it's remarkable that MSC has managed through its program uh, to deliver 19%. Our target is 30%. We think that's possible as a, as a, as a um, market-driven um, uh, programme. But in order to move at scale, I think we're looking much more at government engagement. And as governments are thinking about MPAs, and that is, you know, sometimes closing the ocean, it's sometimes about setting up protected spaces where fishing is required to be fished, you know, conducted on sustainable principles. So we have sustainable fisheries actually at MSC which work within MPAs. Um, so, you know, long story short, I think it's about having to get governments on board, having to get not the usual suspects of well-managed fisheries in European or Northern climes, you know. So we're actively working with the government of Indonesia at the moment. We're very interested in how do they start moving their fisheries across to sustainable practices. It might not be that they come into a programme like the MSE, which is very linked to the market, but it might be that they can get their own fishing industry to move towards those sustainable practices in order to kind of protect the long-term health of, of you know, what is a, a national resource for places like Indonesia. Now, I wanted to give one final question to the audience online. Francisco, do we have any questions online? Yes, we have plenty. We've got over 20. So thanks, everyone. Wonderful. Maybe just because we're almost so at time one. one. Um, so we have one from Ana Rita from Portugal, actually. 
uh, and she congrats you for the talks. And uh, she asks, uh, in your opinion, how do researchers who explore marine resources to promote the blue economy can bridge the gap with policymakers to communicate the results and their impact on society? And she compliments saying, what do we, so I think she includes herself, uh, have to do to, uh, to be heard? Okay, we've got one minute maybe that picks up Paul. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if I knew the answer, I'd be doing it better, right? Um, so I don't know the answer, but I, I think part of the answer at least is, is, is working actively with stakeholders right from the beginning of the question. So whatever that question might be is understanding who, uh, who needs to know the answer, understanding what they really need. Uh, and engaging them in the process so that when you're, when you, you, you just to the extent of language, people don't necessarily understand the language I use. Uh, and so I'm just getting back to the basics of co developing, co designing, uh, and co producing information, I think is probably the fundamental change we need. Can I, and can I add to that actually and um, say that under the decade for ocean science, this is exactly what we're doing? So Goose is leading three projects which are co-designing uh, this information and this information space. So I recommend to Anna to take a look at the, the um, decade, UN decade projects that we're working on. One is looking at um, uh, co-designing information for coastal regions and to understand you know, the, the ocean observation needs within that space. And another is looking at some of these big projects around ocean carbon, um, uh, marine resources, and um, and pr prediction of, of, of extreme events to bring the strengthen the needs for the observation, to and but to match that strengthening to what what the um, stakeholders, what industry, what is uh, what governments are needing. Um, so that this is really about co-designing science to answer the, the challenges, and we are doing it already. Now, unfortunately, we are out of time, and I've been asked to make sure that we finish on time. Please join me in thanking our panellists for the session today. <laughs>